In this video, we'll discuss the higher level portion for B1.2 on proteins. Now we know that in order for a protein to be functional, it has to fold into a very specific shape. So what determines that shape? How is that folding pattern determined? Well, it's all based on the R groups, okay? So those R groups are the functional groups that make each of the 20 amino acids different. And they can differ in a variety of ways. So some of those R groups are nonpolar and some of them are polar. Some of them have a charge, okay? And some of them don't have a charge. Some of them are acidic, some of them are basic. Some are made out of ring structure. Some of them are not made out of rings. And then they're, of course, made up of a variety of different elements. And so there's a lot of chemical diversity in these R groups. Some of them are going to love each other and be attracted to each other and want to bond with each other. And others are going to repel each other. And because they're all connected into a chain, that kind of like movement, attraction, and bonding is going to cause the protein to fold into a very particular shape. And of course, all of that is determined by the sequence of amino acids, which was encoded for in DNA. So all of this is connected. There are four levels of protein structure, and they're called primary, you may see it written like this, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. So primary structure is just that sequence of amino acids. It's determined by the DNA. It's held together by peptide bonds. It is not a functional protein in this structure. So this is literally just that sequence of amino acids. It's super easy to figure out primary structure. If you know what the DNA sequence is, it's very easy to figure out what string of amino acids or what pattern of amino acids that will make. The structure that it will fold into is much, much more difficult to determine because as you'll see in a moment, it's dependent on lots of different interactions between that R group. It's really hard to figure out which ones will be attracted and repelled, especially if you get into proteins that have thousands of amino acids. This is where some really cool new technology and AI tools are being utilized. Um, so maybe we'll find out some more about that in the coming years. So in addition to being um, covalently bonded to an adjacent amino acid through that peptide bond, we're also going to find that there are hydrogen bonds between different amino acids somewhere in our polypeptide chain. So the carboxyl group and the amine group are both polar, and that means that they have the potential to be held together by hydrogen bonds. And that is going to lead to secondary structure. So secondary structure um, is going to come in two different forms forms. It can either be an alpha helix, so kind of something that results like this, or a beta pleated sheet, more of a zigzag. And again, that's caused by hydrogen bonding between amino acids, not the adjacent ones. Those are connected by peptide bonds, but rather hydrogen bonding between non-adjacent amino acids in the chain. Now, each hydrogen bond on its own is relatively weak, but when you have a lot of them together, those bonds, that strength kind of accumulates, and this is really going to help to stabilize that protein structure. Now, in this picture, I can see the secondary structure, the beta pleated sheet, and the alpha helix still remain. However, there is additional folding in my chain due to interactions between the R groups of amino acids. So remember that these hydrogen bonds that exist for secondary structure are between the carboxyl groups and the amine groups. These that are causing tertiary structure are going to be between those different R groups. So tertiary structure folding due to interactions between R groups. We have to associate those together. Now this can look like a lot of different things. This gets really wild. Um, so I can have ionic bonds between different charged R groups. That's very cool. I can have hydrogen bonds between polar R groups. I can have disulfide bonds. So that's a type of covalent bond um, between two types of amino acids that both include sulfur. 
this is a really strong one. Or I could even have hydrophobic interactions, like two nonpolar amino acids that are kind of like folding in and hiding with each other to get away from water, right? So all of these different interactions are going to result in a very complex folding, further folding, in addition to the folding that already existed in secondary structure. One of the reasons why that folding is so important to a protein's function is because different proteins in different locations might need different amino acids either facing outside or inside. So for example, globular proteins are round proteins and they need to be soluble. They need to be within the cytoplasm. So let's say something like an enzyme, right? Well, in order for that protein to be soluble, it needs to make sure that on the outside of the sphere, it's got all kinds of polar amino acids, right? So that it can be soluble in water. Any non-polar amino acids need to be in the core. So when that protein folds into its functional shape, all of the polar ones or all of the surface should be covered with polar amino acids. On the other hand, transmembrane proteins, so like this one, or let's even talk about this channel protein, they need to span the entire membrane. So that means they need to go all the way from the outside of a cell to the inside of the cell. Well, that's a little bit tricky because this cell membrane is made up of phospholipids and these heads are going to be hydrophilic and that means that they are going to be polar. So any part of the protein that is embedded in that section needs to also be polar but it goes all the way through the membrane. And these sections in here are nonpolar and water hating. So that means the amino acids in this section of the protein also need to be nonpolar. So when a transmembrane protein folds into its functional shape, again, that shape is so important to the function. We've got to make sure that the right amino acids are in the right location. So where a protein is, okay, is it in a membrane? Is it in the cytoplasm? Where is it? And what it does um, will require different amino acids to be present, not only in different parts of the chain, but folded into different parts of the protein that are exposed to different parts in that environment. And now it's time to get into our final level of protein structure, which is quaternary structure. So quaternary structure means that I don't just have one polypeptide that's intricately folded. I have multiple polypeptides that are all kind of connected together. And in order for that protein to be functional, it has to have all of those polypeptide chains put together. Okay, so quaternary consisting of more than one polypeptide chain. They can either be conjugated or non-conjugated. Non-conjugated means it's just the polypeptide chains. So something like insulin or collagen, they're still quaternary, they're still different polypeptide chains, but it's just pure polypeptideness, just pure um, amino acids folded into their shape. Other proteins like hemoglobin are what we call conjugated. So that means that they are going to consist of polypeptide chains, but also non-polypeptide parts. So here I'm looking at hemoglobin and it's got one, two, three, four polypeptides. It just so happens that it has four. That's not really what makes it quaternary. Anything that includes more than one polypeptide is quaternary. But anyways, one, two, three, four polypeptides. But then it also has what's called a heme group. Okay. So if I were to label this, each of these is going to be a polypeptide chain. And again, I have four of them. One, two, three, four. Uh oh, <laughs> there we go. And a non polypeptide group, um, which is this heme group. And again, it's got four of those as well. So because of that, this is what we call a conjugated protein. Now, how have we talked about protein classification? Well, we mentioned it can be classified based on its level of structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. 
or I can classify it based on whether or not it is conjugated or not conjugated. That's a different way of classifying it. And now we're going to talk about a final way to classify proteins. And regardless of their level of structure or whether they're conjugated or not conjugated, I could further separate proteins into two groups of either being fibrous or globular. Fibrous proteins are proteins like this one. This is collagen, okay? They are proteins that are quaternary, so more than one polypeptide. I can see those here in different colors that are long and they're not highly folded, okay? So these are gonna look like bands of fiber, um, especially in micrographs, they're gonna look rope-like and they have a high tensile strength. So that means I can really pull on them and they're going to remain intact. Okay, so fibrous proteins, I'd like to think of being as like rope-like structures. A great example here is collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in our body, and it makes up a lot of really important connective tissue, like our tendons, our ligaments, the whites of our eye, a lot of our skin, okay? And so it's non-soluble, it's a long, a very strong quaternary protein, and again, form and function, okay, that makes it great for things like connective tissue that connects muscles to bones and stuff like that. That's going to be very different than things like our friend insulin here. So insulin is an example of a globular protein, and it looks like a glob, right? These are kind of rounded in shape, and they are generally soluble. And their shape is very important. It's highly folded into these very, very intricate shapes. And so instead of being really for like structure and like strong, these are going to be more of our like intricately functioning proteins. So they might have like a really, um, you know, specific shape to the active site, or it might be a hormone like insulin that has to like attach to certain certain cells. Okay, so a different form and a different function. If its function is like for strength, we want to be thinking of fibrous proteins. And if its function is more for like catalyzing reactions and that kind of stuff, we want to be thinking globular proteins.